In the previous segment, we saw how Judah, in type as a person living in the end times, lost his true self and became one with shame. And out of this, then, codependence develops. And we will see in the scripture something here about codependence as we continue on with our study of Genesis 38. In order to study codependency, we need a definition of what it is. And as I've studied the subject, I've come across many different definitions, but here are two that I thought said it well. The first one is an exaggerated dependent pattern of learned behaviors, beliefs, and feelings that make life painful. It is a dependence on people and things outside the self, along with neglect of the self to the point of having little identity. And that was by S. Smalley. And the second one, any suffering and or dysfunction that is associated with or results from focusing on the needs and behavior of others. That was by Charles Whitfield, M.D. And uh, I, I added in there, re resulting in the neglect of the true self, because he does go ahead and say that. And so we can see how Judah has set himself up for codependency because he's lost his true self. And uh, we'll see in the next verse how this has uh, taken place in his life. Genesis 38.3 says, And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. She, of course, is referring to Judah's wife, which typically was the principle of shame. And uh, he became one with shame. It became his identity. And out of this comes an understanding. Remember, a son would represent the understanding. And he called his name Ur, which is watchful. So out of becoming one with shame, uh, he has this understanding now that he has to be watchful all the time. He has to see what the people around him uh, think about him. And he wants to act in such a way that he can please them, that they won't hurt him, and that they can validate his identity in some way. And this is how the whole thing of codependence then begins in a person's life because they're finding their identity in other people. Uh, they don't know who they are. And they find answers to questions that they're asking unconsciously through other people. But these are questions that really God should be answering for us. These are questions such as, Am I loved? Am I valuable? Does my life count for something? And uh, so people are unconsciously asking those questions. And when we've lost our true self, then we cannot really find that communion with God where those questions can be answered. And, uh, and so we look to other people to tell us the answer to our question. And we'll often uh, try to please other people and do things for them to our own detriment. We're so desperate to have their approval and uh, for them to tell us who we are. Sometimes we watch people that we admire and we begin to imitate them. I've seen people start to dress like the person that they admire or take on their hairstyle or some of their mannerisms and it's because they don't really know who they are. So they get caught up in doing rather than being. Some activity and what people think of them then becomes their identity and they lose any concept of their own self and what their own self would want. And it perpetuates our facade of false identities because we act one way around some people and we're with another group of people we'll act in a different way. And so really we're just we're putting on a facade, we're putting on false personas. If we've been seriously abused and that abuse is ongoing in life, we can be creating whole new personalities. If we've just lost our true self, then we are just doing what we can to avoid being hurt. But it's all being uh, de deceitful. We're not being true to ourselves. We're not being true to the people around us. And even though we might be doing good things for them, we're doing it for the wrong motive because the true motive isn't unconditional love and wanting to help them. But the true motive is wanting to be uh, identified as a person of worth and value and finding our worth and value in what they think of us, what they say about us. And this is building on sand. 
This Hebrew word er also means opening the eyes and to be naked. And uh, this reminds me very much of what took place in the Garden of Eden with original sin when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and uh, their eyes were opened and they knew they were ne naked. The scripture says uh, Genesis 3 7 and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So that was uh, the response of Adam and Eve and one of the characteristics of original sin is our tendency to take on shame and to hide ourselves. They sewed fig leaves together and made aprons and we put up walls and put up false identities in order to hide the nakedness that we think others can see in us. But really, chances are they don't see it. They're too busy trying to cover their own nakedness and their own feelings of shame. In verse 4, we're going to see another adverse effect of having shame in our life that we're not willing to acknowledge. So Genesis 38, 4, And she conceived again, and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. So uh, the principle of shame brings forth another understanding, and his name is Onan. Onan means strong or forceful in the sense of self-effort. I think it's interesting that in Genesis 38.3 it was Judah that named the son Ur, like it was his decision to be watchful. That's how he decided he was going to handle the way he dealt with his shame, by watching other people and putting on these false personas. But here she calls his name Onan. It's the principle of shame then brings forth this uh, understanding of having to be uh, forceful and strong in the sense of self-effort. It's like this comes forth out of shame. It's not like it's his conscious decision to do this. It's just an outcropping of the shame that uh, is part of his life now. So what we do is we disguise our shame in the form of other feelings and behaviors and then project them onto other people. They don't realize what we're doing and we don't realize what we're doing. But this can have a devastating effect on other people. Here is a list of some of the feelings and behaviors that we might project onto other people if we're living out of a base of shame. Things happen in life that are upsetting Life doesn't go the way we planned. There's always going to be potholes in the road and unexpected things that come up. And if we have a good ground of being, if we know who we are in Christ, we can take these in stride. But people that live with shame all the time uh, and they don't know who they are are not going to be able to take all these glitches as gracefully. Sometimes the littlest thing can cause a person with shame to erupt in anger or rage and people around them look at them like whoa my goodness where did that come from this is certainly not anything that should justify that kind of explosion well it's just because of the shame down inside it's just like it gets uncorked and they erupt some people cannot relax and be comfortable unless everything in the room is in the place it should be and everything is clean and that's perfectionism. They're just uncomfortable unless everything is perfect. Whereas a person with uh, the, a true self, a good ground of being, it doesn't bother them if things are out of place or even messy. Sometimes when things don't go the way we want, if we have a shame-based identity, then uh, we're going to withdraw from other people and put up our walls. And then other people uh, receive this as being abandonment and they think that we don't want to be around them uh, we don't love them anymore but it's just that shame down inside that causes us to react that way or we might blame other people maybe for something we did ourselves but we just can't bear the feeling that we're not perfect and so we blame other people for it the following is a list of some of these uh, projected feelings and behaviors anger rage resentment, blame, contempt, 
attack, compulsive behavior, control, perfectionism, neglect or withdrawal, abandonment, and disappointment. I got this list from Healing the Child Within by Dr. Charles Whitfield. Unfortunately, most people, when they have some of the problem behaviors and feelings that are listed here, they go to work on overcoming that particular problem with self-effort. And that's never the answer to the problem. We need to go to the very root of the problem, which has to do with our feelings about ourselves and, uh, and who we are. And we're going to find, as we study here with Judah, that he's going to be one who's going to go to the root of the problem. He's going to find out what's wrong. He's going to do something about it. He's going to make some good decisions. And he's going to come out of the feeling of shame and the codependency and the projected feelings and behaviors. And he's going to come into perfection in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have some really good things that we can learn from him as we continue our study of Genesis 38. At last, Judah, a type of a person living in the end times, begins to make some good decisions. And here's the first good decision he makes in Genesis 38, 5. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chazib when she bare him. So again, out of his union with shame, a new understanding is born. And Sheila's name means request, petition, and ask. So this is obviously prayer. He decides in his midst of his misery with uh, his codependent behavior, which doesn't solve any problems, and with projecting feelings and behaviors onto other people, he can see that this isn't doing any good. It's just hurting others. And so he decides he's going to pray about his situation. Now, he was at Chazib when this son was born. Now, Chazib means falsified. And so, he has made this decision to pray. And prayer is going to begin out of a false self because he doesn't know who he is because that true self uh, got buried down deep inside several verses back. And so, he's going to be praying out of a false self, but he knows it's the right thing to do. It's difficult to pray out of a false self. I remember many years ago when I made the decision that I was going to have to pray or my life was uh, going to be just terrible. Things were not going the way I wanted them to go and it would be a disaster if God did not intervene. And so I got really serious about prayer. And uh, But it was difficult. I remember praying about everything I could think of and looked at my watch and I'd only prayed for five minutes and I had no idea how you could pray for you know half an hour or an hour or something like that but I persisted I had to pray there was no other answer in my life and so I just continued in it and when we do persevere the Lord's going to help us and it's going to get easier as we continue some people are held back from prayer because they feel like they're a hypocrite. Well, uh, when I get my life together, then I can go to God and I can pray about things. But but right now, God wouldn't even want to listen to my prayers. And that's not true. God wants to listen to our prayers. And none of us goes to God because we're righteous in ourselves. We go to God because the blood of Jesus has made that way, made the way for us to come into his presence and to pray and so none of us is worthy of that it's God's free gift to us and we need to take advantage of it and and get serious about our prayer life it's a decision that we make it's not a feeling if we first uh, wait to pray until we feel like praying we're not going to do it because the feeling to pray isn't going to come on us very often we, we need to make the decision that this is what I'm going to do based on what God's Word says, based on hearing and obeying. And we're told in the Word that we are to pray. Therefore, we should pray. And uh, I remember a video series that we had in our church many years ago entitled, Could You Not Tarry for One Hour? And the teaching was based on 
what Jesus said to his disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane when his death was approaching and he was agonizing over what was coming and he asked his th three closest disciples to be with him and just stand with him in, in his um, time of need and they just fell asleep and he came back and said could you not tarry for one hour and I was convicted by that and I thought why can't I pray an hour every day so I made that decision many years ago and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made I used to watch the clock until the hour was done and uh, you can get a lot said in an hour but then it got so I didn't want to look at the clock because the time went by too quickly and uh, prayer got to be a delight and something that I could pray for hours and enjoy every minute of it but that comes through perseverance and years of uh, obeying God and, and praying out of obedience. It's a very good thing that Judah has begun a life of prayer, but he still is persisting in his self-effort, as we'll see in this verse. Genesis 38, 6, And Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Now Tamar is the principle of sanctification. We know this because women are certain principles, and the name T Tamar means erect and palm tree. To be erect is to be upright. The scripture has many good things to say about the upright, such as Psalm 18:23, I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. So we see here being upright has to do with the absence of sin. In Psalm 84:11. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So there are good things to be had in the life of a person who walks uprightly before God. And so Judah has seen something here that he really wants in his own life. Uh, not only does Tamar mean to be upright, but also palm tree. And the scripture says in Psalm 92, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. So certainly he wants his life to flourish. So he's got a vision here of something that he wants very much. and uh, But he doesn't know how to do it. Uh, so he doesn't understand just being and just becoming or letting God do the work in his life. He sets out to do it himself. Er, of course, means watchful and we talked about this earlier, how he would look to other people to see how he should act and then try to be and act the way he thinks the people would want him to be. And so he's carrying that on now in his Christian life uh, as he tries to live in sanctification. Sanctification has to do with holiness, purity, completeness, perfection, and wholeness. And so there's no way he's going to be able to act this out but that's his plan that's what he's going to try to do and then in the next verse we'll see that God isn't going to let him persist with his plan it's not going to work out and that's a good thing here in this verse we'll see how God deals with what Judah's doing here uh, trying to uh, continue on in his old ways of acting out something that he's really not goes on and says here in verse 7 and Ur Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord and the Lord slew him so that's how God deals with these things he just slays them and uh, this might seem really harsh but that's God's way of course here in the historical sense it was a person a real person but in our lives it's whatever activity or whatever thing we are using uh, to find a false self, self, sense of righteousness and um, identity in. Even when we become Christians and we begin praying and we want sanctification in our life, we continue in uh, self-effort of trying to prove that we are somebody, trying to cover over our feelings of shame, and it just isn't going to go with God. I like what Oswald Chambers said about sanctification in My Utmost for His Highest on the February 8th meditation. 
When we pray, asking God to sanctify us, are we prepared to measure off to what that really means? We take the word sanctification much too lightly. Are we prepared to pay the cost of sanctification? The cost will be a deep restriction of all our earthly concerns and an extensive cultivation of all our godly concerns. Sanctification means to be intensely focused on God's point of view. It means to secure and to keep all the strength of our body, soul, and spirit for God's purpose alone. Are we really prepared for God to perform in us everything for which He separated us? And after He has done His work, are we then prepared to separate ourselves to God just as Jesus did? For their sakes I sanctify myself. It's John seventeen nineteen. The reason some of us have not entered into the experience of sanctification is that we have not realized the meaning of sanctification from God's perspective. Sanctification means being made one with Jesus so that the nature that controlled Him will control us. Are we really prepared for what that will cost? It will cost absolutely everything in us which is not of God. I'd like to share here how God slew Ur in my own life. I was a musician from the time I was about four years old uh, when I began taking piano lessons and playing in recitals. Uh, when I was a little older, around age nine or ten, I got a flute and uh, that became my specialty. Um, I practiced several hours a day and uh, I got lots of awards and scholarships and basically I got a lot of attention and uh, I didn't realize it but this was what I used to form my identity and this is what gave my life uh, purpose and meaning and made me a person who was um, valued because I played the flute well and of course this is uh, building an identity on sand and God could not let that go on so when I got really interested in God and developing a prayer life and uh, became a leader in the church and my husband was the pastor and uh, I wanted to bring my music into the church I thought well there's no orchestras to play in out here in the boonies where God sent us to live so I'll just play in the church but every time I tried to do something God would thw would thwart it he just wasn't going to let me do it he says uh, it's okay if you learn to play the guitar and strum that a little bit and lead in some songs in home home groups I'll let you do that but it's like the flute never nothing became of that anymore and that was very difficult uh, very painful and uh, but I had no idea what God had planned for my life and over time I did die to that I got so I didn't care if I played the flute or not it didn't mean anything to me and uh, in fact it's been in the safe now for about uh, three years uh, I'm still holding on to it because I think God has a purpose for it later on but uh, I had no idea that God called me to minister to his most severely abused people I had no idea God wanted me to write books or uh, develop a website or have a ministry of uh, the end times helping people uh, understand God's plan for bringing them into the fullness of his spirit and into his kingdom and I had no idea and certainly I didn't think I could do any of these things and so anything I do like that I know it's the Lord because I didn't have any special training for it and uh, so God had something much better for me and I'm so thankful that God did not let me have what I wanted but it was very painful when he stripped it away and God didn't say uh, well I'm taking this away from you now but don't worry because I have something better for you he didn't say that he just takes it away and by faith we have to know that God is doing in our life what is best for us and that he understands us better than we understand ourselves he sees our heart we don't understand our own heart and uh, we don't know the gifts and calling that God has placed on our lives and so we just have to trust him but it's scary and it's painful but it's very necessary in order to go on with God into the fullness of what he has for us